That's the intro of the song that um, we're going to be looking today at my little uh, score study uh, thing here. And so um, for those of you new to the series, my name is Drew Zaremba and the Arrangers Facebook page uh, nominated me as their Arranger of the Month and uh, they asked me to walk through a couple of my scores. So um, without being too narcissistic here, uh, we're going to take a look at this uh, chart of mine called Kangaroo Brews Blues, the story behind it and some of the We'll look through the score together and uh, tell you, I'll tell you what I was thinking at different times uh, during the chart. So uh, thanks for your interest and uh, let's uh, move over to the main scene. Thanks OBS. These aren't high quality videos uh, as far as video production, but hopefully they're entertaining and useful for what they are. Forgive the lag if there is any on the screen. Um, so uh, before you uh, before we go any further, I recommend you listen to it. You can just check it out here, um, uh, SoundCloud.com, my site, and uh, Kangaroo Brews Blues. Um, it is a long chart, uh, but it's a lot of solos. It's blues, four solos. So um, we got to record this with Toshi Clinch's big band. Uh, he's an amazing arranger who now lives in Australia, but he asked me to, uh, to supply a couple tracks for the album. So here we are. Um, and uh, so here we are, uh, Kangaroo Brews Blues. I like to say here we are a lot. Um, the story behind it, if you listen to the head, um, that sort of thing, it's uh, kind of similar to another blues head, and that's because this actually started as an arrangement of um, mumbles. by Clark Terry. Um, this was uh, written for the Carmine Caruso International uh, Trumpet Competition. And, uh, and, and Clark Terry had recently passed, and uh, the judges were Ingrid Jensen, Bobby Shue, and um, Clay Jenkins. And there was another trumpet uh, featured on this chart, uh, D the Dennis Dotson uh, of Houston. And so uh, they asked me to arrange mumbles to feature these four trumpeters. So I was like, oh my goodness, how am I, how is this going to work? Um, and I immediately thought, okay, well, it's a blues, so there's a lot of flexibility there. And um, that means it could be treated a number of different ways. The blues, as we know, is very flexible. And so I thought, okay, perfect. We can just have uh, these four amazing soloists featured in their own limelight. And then they'll do some trading and all that stuff. So, uh, but in a in a in that will change the chart as it conforms to the personality of the uh, soloist. And so um, that's basically how the chart was born. And then after, and I'll walk you through that part rather than explain all of them now. And then uh, I wanted to be able to sell the chart and play it a lot. And so I just modified the melody and a couple of the other parts so that way it would work together. Um, as an original composition, um, all the respect and love to Clark Terry, um, but I didn't want to have to deal with all the publishing and, and copyright rigmarole. So um, this is now Kangaroo Brews Blues um, because it was recorded on Toshi's album and Kangaroo Brews Blues just sounds like a great chart title. If I had to retitle it, it would be retitled like Study on the Blues, but that just sounds so much more academic. <laughs> um, so this is more fun and yeah, so traditional big band with an optional vibraphone part here. And uh, twelve, good old 12-bar blues, four-bar intro. I do like that intro. I like I like trumpets and I like fourths. And I, uh, boo -boo -boo -boo, uh, modern saxophone counterlines. I love, uh, this is Thad Jones, more or less. Upper structure triads, um, uh, dom lots, of dominant, lots of dominant passing chords down here. Um, generally typical voicings and uh, octave, octaves in the saxes. And we come down immediately to a small group. Some people might say, oh, why not start with a in two head? Well, it is walking the entire time, but there are enough other textures in the tune and I just want this thing to be swinging from the get go. So we are in four, we are walking and uh, we are, um, and there's gangbusters right out of the gate. So um, small group melody here, uh, alto tenor, uh, trumpet and trombone with the alto, uh, ideally with a vibraphone, introducing our four soloists when it was a trumpet 
feature, it was all four trumpets playing the melody to mumbles. And, um, <coughs> and now, uh, but I adapted it for a big band, so that way you don't need four extra trumpet soloists. Um, and uh, uh, so it's within the band. So uh, splitting up to between different timbres, bone, trumpet, rhythm, and saxophone. So um, uh, little, that's, this is how we get to our small group melody here. The choice, that's how I made that choice. A lot of groups don't have vibraphones, so alto becomes the soloist um, to help carry that. Um, and then we have uh, the, the second time through the melody. Uh, this, these, are, these bars are moving pretty quick, so I'm, I'm not trying to change too much too often because uh, time is going by uh, as just a, a, the bars are moving by quickly, but time is still the same. And so, um, you know, even if it looks like there might not be a lot happening on the page, it's only occupying a few seconds. So I'm not afraid of a lot of rests uh, at this particular moment. Um, and we have a, just a good old block voicing in the saxophones here. Blah, blah, blah. Um, unison counterline in the bones. Um, uh, little, this whole section is leading to another shout chorus moment, but it's short lived. We move immediately on to one of my favorite textures um, from Bill Holman and many others, of course, but Bill Holman did it most famously, which is three part counterpoint, um, where I'm just seeking to have as much rhythmic and harmonic balance between the three parts as much as possible. Um, and so even though it looks like there's not a lot happening here, but the saxophones are taking over. So uh, contrapuntal writing is um, really one of my favorite things to do, um, even though not a lot of the time I get to use it, but uh, it's uh, just a great technique that I think is underused in big band writing, um, especially more swing kind of charts. Um, so there's, there's balance for everything. This is a score study, not a teach, not a pedagogical thing, Drew. Shut up. So, a uh, little canon effect here. With while a descending bass line uh, sustains interest. And we this whole contrapuntal section culminates here in uh, this moment here. The uh, homophonic climax, as, as it were. Good old upper structures, uh, upper structure. It's uh, over the trombones covering the third, seven, and thirteenth um, bass trombone in the depths where he or she belongs, um, and we and that leads us to a nice uh, send off to our first soloist, the uh, vibraphones and guitar, if no vibraphone. So there we have it. Um, we're on to the first solo, uh, and um, I leave it open for them. As long as they want to go, backgrounds we bring in the second time, uh, uh, the last two times, cueing a new section rather than making everyone confused and saying, "Oh, let's do E the last time, but not the first time." I, I can't deal with all of that. So, new section. We can always print more music. We can always uh, print more pages. It's worth it for the clarity of the musicians. Um, and we layer it in. This is kind of. Uh, stolen from Oliver Nelson's uh, arrangement on um, By the Riverside. Um, trombones providing some kicks uh, the second time. And then we get to uh, 13 of my favorite bars in the piece. Uh, this is Thad Jones Technique 101. Uh, Thad, this, a lot of this chart comes out of Thad and naturally out of John Clayton, um, two of my favorite uh, composers ever. Um, and arrangers ever. Um, and so uh, this is a very simple uh, melody. Almost entire, it's basically the pentatonic scale with a blue note. Um, so uh, that's what that is, but the harmony is all of these dominant chords. Um, sorry. 
So that is um, the approach there. Descending bass line, moving in contrary motion with the melody, always a, a recipe for success. Um, and what are the saxophones doing? Well, they're playing a bunch of notes, as they darn well should be. Um, I am a saxophone player, and so I always want to write myself some fun lines and make everyone else curse at me. So uh, this is just some... Uh, uh, once I established the harmony, then I wrote the counterline to connect through all of those um, changes. So uh, repetition is uh, your friend. So we do almost the exact same phrase here, but different harmonies because it's blues and it's the new part of the harmony and we want it, every part to lead into the other. Um, and then we are going into uh, one more climactic phrase. I just really didn't feel like 12 bars was enough. We arrived at this climax and this moment I felt like needed to be bigger. And so uh, I just went, I said, it needs another bar. Uh, why not uh, stretch it out? Um, uh, we are often too confined by form. And so I try to break that down when I can. Um, it serves the music. It serves, let the melody, ser uh, let the phrase serve the melody, uh, the phrase length that is, um, not the other way around. There's sometimes you got to squeeze it in, but um, it's my chart, so I can do all sorts of things. Um, and so this sets up for, oh, and uh, right, the soloists. Um, so this was Dennis Dodson's uh, original part, and it was it's just the normal blues, a nice place to start and build from, right? And then we get to, uh, the, uh, it, it mumbles um, in, Clark Terry would often do a stop time in the middle of his solo. And so I thought this would be a great way to start the solo of the trombone, in this case, Bobby Shue, um, and uh, just as a new texture. We've been listening to swing for a long time now. Let's break it up with some stop time. Um, and it directly came out of mumbles, although it might be something I just do normally on a blues. Works really well. Um, and then we start to, uh, it's just one beat every two bars on beat one. Keep it real simple, and uh, then we embellish it a little more in our second chorus. You know, some, it's just a lot of traditional blues writing here. <laughs> uh, a few more hits, to, so that way we communicate to the listener that things are changing, things are evolving, and we move ahead. And uh, a break that leads to another send-off and walking. Voila. Um, and a doit because uh, the lead we gotta gotta feed the lead trumpet player some red meat every once in a while, um, and uh, so here we are. The soloist continues continues blowing, and I think uh, this was just a fun. I you know we're still in sort of traditional blues here, and so I thought keep the backgrounds bluesy, don't get too modern, don't get too crazy. Plungers came to mind. Wap wap Charleston right. Um, this is uh, kind of where this all came from. Um, and then they're done with their solo. And between each soloist, I put a 12 bar interlude because um, it gives the listener a chance to appreciate the soloist and wonder, oh, what's gonna come next? And I get to express myself a little bit in terms of the writing um, to connect some of the this material together. And uh, let me take a solo, the, the writer, right? Uh, a lot of chromaticism here. Um, I'm just trying to, what I'm trying to do is transition us to Ingrid Jensen's solo part, which is a double blues with all 13 chords. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, her, she's known for her modern playing. Um, she can play just about anything, really. Um, but this is uh, kind of Ingrid changes. And when she saw them, she's like, oh, you went all Ingrid on it. <laughs> and uh, that really uh, touched me. So um, she, yeah, she's just an amazing person and uh, an amazing uh, musician. Um, very fortunate to get to write for her. And another piece coming, but that's for another time. Um, so I'm in this transition here, I am starting to lengthen the phrases in order so that the transition into the double, the double sus blues feels natural. So these B flat 13 a sus starting to set that up. Ooh, that's uh, 
that's where that sort of ideas come from. Uh, repeating the idea of the saxophones in the rhythm section to signal that we're bringing it down. Uh, decrescendos, of course, all around. The trumpets are out. Um, so, and then we get to our sus blues, double blues, um, which just gives so much more flexibility and options to the improviser uh, to play on. Um, they can take it out a lot more because now I'm controlling the comping too. Oh, there's a little birdie outside my window. Hello. Um, and uh, the... Uh, yeah, so I'm controlling the comping now. Uh, so they're always going to get the same thing. So it's really up to the soloist to make things happen. Um, telling the drummer, mostly cymbals, transparent, yada, yada, yada. We get through our first blues and we bring in some backgrounds. Um, uh, and I, I don't want to get in the way of the soloist. So um, this is a, a softer section and we still want to grow. So I do cut mutes, bucket mutes, and I tell the saxophones, you better play soft. Um, so, uh, that's where this idea comes from. And then we still have this, you know, pads, essentially I'm orchestrating the rhythm section now in the saxophones and the trumpets, Harmon mutes fun for that. And I have a little counter line, uh, in the bones and later the berry, uh, in order to just have a little motion through it. So it's not completely, uh, barren. Um, but yeah, this was, this is a fun little texture. Um, whenever I can, I, I want to use mutes and uh, and other things like that. It seems like I've frozen. If I can fix it quickly, I will. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, all right, I think we're back. Sorry about that. And uh, so yeah, whenever I can try to fix the texture, I, I do so, uh, fix the texture. When I change the texture, Big band is, is a bunch of horns, you know, the saxophones are horns. And so if I can get new colors, uh, other interesting things going on in there, then um, uh, that's what I can do. Um, yeah, sorry about the frozen video there. Uh, I'm going to keep trudging on. Um, and another send off, but this time we're coming down uh, rather than a big send off because of the uh, sensitivity of the section previous. Um, so here we go, a little more backgrounds and finally one more transition. And I'm starting to get um, not bored of E flat, but it's starting to feel a little stale. It feels like we've explored a lot in E flat. And so I, and B flat is another, both E flat and B flat are great keys for the trumpet to improvise in. Um, nice open keys, very flexible. And so I think uh, I'd said, all right, it's time for a modulation. This is a long tune. And so going to different key centers is a uh, welcome. Um, so here we go with a little couple seconds. And uh, which completely cleanses the palette. Oh, what's happening? What's gonna, what's going on? That's the fun part of this. So, uh, and then a little saxophone soli. We go to soprano here to get a little extra range. Um, I love fourths, like I said. Blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, taking the pressure off the trumpets all, the whole time, passing it between the sections, so that way the trumpets don't yell at me too much, uh, more than they already do anyways. And so, finally we arrive at Clay Jenkins' um, uh, solo section. And uh, so I thought, Ah, he's known for his abstract playing and he can play really out. Um, he can also, he can, all these trumpet players can do anything they wanted to, but I wanted to kind of capture a little bit of their essence um, and what they're known for and what I assume they enjoy doing. So uh, I thought, why not break the whole thing down? At the time it was Rich DeRosa, my old mentor um, and teacher for many years uh, who's going to play drums. And so I knew he and Rich would have a great chemistry and, and make something happen. And so I uh, decided to go with this very barren texture that would bring the whole thing down, a breakdown of sorts. And from here, it would uh, develop and go crazy out uh, from here on out. And so in it also, I changed the changes, uh, reharmonized the blues, An another alteration. So... Uh, Whereas before it was sus, I think it fit as a warm color, you know, um, uh, like a big hug. And then this is more angular because of all these, all the uh, major sevenths present in the voicing. 
and so that's going to be more aggressive. And just by simply reharming here, uh, it's more open. There's fewer movements. Um, it's uh, not quite modal. It's still uh, tonal, but it is uh, uh, has, has a much different flavor and a more open feel because of that. And uh, rather than backgrounds, just let the rhythm section comp freely uh, for clay um, and uh, really nice and open here. So that's kind of the, the philosophy of the um, chart here and how I was able to uh, create a structure out of it, going up and down, um, doing different things. So that is um, that. And now it's time to wrap things up. Of course, after four trumpet solos, we have to make them fight each other um, as per the international uh, jazz treaties uh, command it. So um, here we are with a bunch of trading. So uh, as is common, uh, the band will take four bars and then we'll trade. So vibes, then the trombone in the same order that they soloed in. Four more bars for the band, then uh, trumpet and tenor. And then we let them go crazy trading fours for four choruses, which means everyone gets to play three times. And we layer backgrounds on top, as is very typical for this uh, style, um, building in uh, to a raucous shout chorus that actually comes down before it comes up again. Um, what am I thinking here? I'm just thinking about moving out in uh, harp, in um, uh, contrary motion. Bass moving down, trumpet moves up. Uh, Occitonic scale, as it happens, as it so happens. Um, and many different chords happening there. These are some Duke Ellington chords. Why do I say that? Because they are a lot of saxophones orchestrated very high. Um, actually, everyone's kind of in a very high register. There's not a lot of bottom to this voice voicing. That was intentional. There actually might not be a third in a, there might not be a third in this voicing, um, which was another intentional move. Oh, there is, but it's very orchestrated, very high. Um, and because I, I wanted something more abstract and uh, just um, because we're about to get to some really thick voicings. And so I wanted something different uh, to build in tension. Um, and I just want to experiment. I'm always trying to experiment and learn. This this chart was written four, uh, three, four years ago. Oh, four years ago, yeah. So, um, uh, more contrary motion. Um, and then this is one of my, I stole this from Dave Brubeck. Yeah, this is a. It's just a. Contrary motion again, but this time the trumpets are coming down, bass is moving up, and it's just triads. Um, so that's uh, pretty fun. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, that is, uh, he, he did it in one of his pieces, and I just thought that is a really cool texture. How cool would that sound with big band? Pretty cool. Um, so, uh, and then to break it up, a little... Uh, Unison counter, unison brass, leading back into our head out, with a little surprise here, little two four bar, um, that I kind of regret writing. Uh, the bands usually mess it up because it's like, whoa, how do you how do you do that after like ten minutes of making you know crazy great music, and then the, the arranger decides to screw it up with them, but it's part of the humor of the piece, and so I really wanted to. Uh, like, oh, the, is it over? Is it over? Is it over? No, it's not. Um, so, uh, and then we finally have a good old Thad Jones ending. It's black, 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 boo. And uh, the last chord is basically the last chord of three and one. I think I might have changed one or two things. Um, but I, it's just such a perfect ending to a blues or a bluesy song. So, um, that is uh, Kangaroo Bruce Blues, and um, I hope you dug it. Uh, thank you for listening. Hope this was insightful, um, and I didn't drown, drown on too long. Uh, uh, thanks for watching. If you dug it, please consider liking and subscribing and all that good stuff. Um, there's a lot of other music on the YouTube channel, so I hope you have a chance to check that out. Have a beautiful day, and we'll talk to you later. Bye.